Welcome to Spiritual Mindfield. Today we are doing uh, the weekly Q and A, and we have here three questions. Well, there's one person asked two questions, and uh, we have two other questions. So I'm going to start with the first one: Is can genuine believers be mind control? Can believers in Jesus Christ actually be controlled in the mind? Can that occur? Can Satan control you, or can humans control? Believers mind or non-believers. So let's go to the scriptures. And we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. And we are going to read verse 9. And we're going to look at 16 and 17. So let's go to verse 9. So verse 9. And this is what it says. Out of the ground the Lord God gave growth to every tree that is pleasing to the eye and good for food. And in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you have here two trees, a tree that gives you life and a tree that brings you death. And we're going to see that in verse 16 and 17. So let's go to verse 16 and 17. And let's see what it says. And the Lord God commanded him, you may eat freely from every tree of the garden. That includes the tree of life. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. So we see that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil brings death. So one tree brings life, and the other tree brings death. So since the institution of man, meaning since the creation of man, God instituted man to have free will. So it's clear that God's creation of humanity was so that they could have free will to choose him or to reject him. So nowhere in scripture do you ever see man's choice being taken away. So here in Genesis, God, the first man, were given the choice. Look, you could eat from all the trees that you like, but from this tree you cannot eat. So he gave him a choice to obey him or to disobey. So we see that the institution, uh, the institution of choice since the very beginning. Now, Let's go to John chapter 10, and let's see what it talks about choice here. So this is referring to believers. So let's see what it says. When he has brought out all his own, now this is Jesus speaking. He, he, goes, ahead of him, he goes ahead of them. And his sheep, meaning Jesus' believers, right, those who follow Christ, follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, in fact, they will flee from him because they do not recognize his voice. So we see here that a believer in this context shows that a believer cannot be mind controlled to defect Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it actually says that it is impossible for a believer, a true genuine believer that has the Holy Spirit, abandon Jesus Christ to follow a stranger here. When it says, follow a stranger, this is in reference to someone who is false, like a false teacher, a false prophet, um, anyone who is really opposed to the truth. That's what stranger here means. It's actually a very negative word that means someone who is false. Then it's, it says, um, because they do not recognize his voice. Well, recognize his voice is just in reference to whatever the person is saying, the sheep or believers know that what he's saying, it is not true. And then, so we, it says, the sheep follow him because they know his voice. That means that they recognize who Jesus is, who the truth is. Why? Because they know the scripture. So if someone comes to trick a true born again believer, they will not fall for it because they already know the Bible. They know the truth and they cannot be deceived. So here, these two verses literally go against mind control. The devil cannot control the mind of believers. Why? Because they have choice. And not only that, the moment a believer is convinced of the truth because they know God's word, the devil, the enemy, cannot convince them or cannot control their mind to abandon Jesus. You can see here, they will not believe the enemy. They will not, they will not believe the stranger. That means they cannot be controlled to believe a stranger, right? Because it says here, they will never follow a stranger. So that these two verses make it clear that a believer cannot be mind controlled. So now let's go to um, now we're gonna see now we're gonna see for non-believers. Can a non-believer be controlled? Can he have his mind controlled? So let's go to Second Timothy. 
and we're going to read verse 26 and it says then they will come to their senses referring to an unbeliever who is being told the gospel or who are you know you're telling them the truth to repent as you can see here the context it says verse 25 he must gently reprove those who oppose him in the hope that god may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth so we see here when it says in verse 26 then they will come to their senses meaning that hopefully they may recognize the error that they're living in and that they may know that the gospel is the truth the only way to escape meaning to escape you know hell and and the grasp of, the grasp of the devil so look what it says then they wake uh they will come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil meaning the trap satan has you trap when you're deceived or when you don't know the truth you're trapped satan has you caged or tied down to now look at this who has taken them captive to do his will so unbelievers they are not mind control in the sense that the devil controls them like a remote control car when you have a remote control car you hit the the stick to go left the remote control goes left you do it right the remote control car goes right you don't have to manipulate the remote control car to go left or right you don't have to deceive the car right because you're controlling every move so even a non-believer cannot be mind control why because when it says they're captured to do his will meaning says a, a non-believer does not know the truth he thinks that the lie is the truth so what the devil does he turns it around he tells them that the the truth is a lie and the lie is the truth so that when satan um manipulates it because it's manipulation and mind control are two different things manipulation has you could put slash deception well mind control there is no deception why because you're being controlled it's not your choice you're being controlled to do whatever the other person wants and you have no choice in the matter so that's unbiblical even unbelievers who do not have the holy spirit and are captive to do his will does not say that they're controlled their minds are controlled by the devil to do his will it just means that since they don't know the truth they're snared meaning they're trapped how through deception that's why they do his will and i'm going to show you this very quickly i don't have it here in my notes but we're going to go very quickly to second thessalonians and i'm going to show you this let me show you very quickly and we're going to start here right here i'm going to start in verse 9 so 9 to to 12. it says um hold on one second okay the coming of the lawless one referring to the antichrist will be accompanied by the working of satan with every kind of power sign and false wonder you see that he does that to deceive you not because if he had mind control over you he doesn't need to deceive you he just controls you automatically well that's not the case he has to deceive you and verse 10 and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing because they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them for this reason god will send them a powerful delusion meaning god would allow for the devil to bring a strong powerful deception so that they believe the lie you see that so for them to do satan's will and to accomplish the devil's purposes they have to first be deceived they're not mind control they're deceived there's two different things verse 12 in order that judgment may come upon all who have disbelieved the truth and delighted in wicked meaning they chose what the devil offered and rejected the truth because they do not believe uh they re they don't they do not love the truth so they rejected the truth so this is not mind control this is just manipulation or deception okay so we see that here now i want to go and give you an example how the devil tries to get into your mind to make you abandon god what does he do for you to abandon god meaning he cannot control your mind so that you can abandon god but he has to work very hard to make you or to put you in such a situation so that you could abandon God. So basically, the devil tries to manipulate your mind through external factors. We're gonna see how that looks like. So we go to Job chapter one, and uh, I'm gonna read verses six to 12. And this is what it says. One day the sons of God, referring to angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Where have you come from, said the Lord to Satan, 
from roaming through the earth, he replied, and walking back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one on earth like him, a man who is blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not placed a hedge on every side around him and his household and all that he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well. And then here the phrase, curse you to your face, it just means to abandon God, meaning to to say things that are untrue. To curse God is to say, I don't want to serve you anymore. You're not worth it. All this trouble has come upon me. And, and to blame God and also to uh, say that you don't want to follow God anymore. That's what it's in reference here, to curse you to your face. Verse 12, very well said the, the Lord to Satan, everything he has is in your hands, but you must not lay a hand on him, the man himself. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So you see here, even Satan has a leash. He cannot do whatever he wants. Mind control is to do whatever he wants. God give, God has a leash on the devil, and he has to ask permission to attack, especially believers. He cannot just go attack believers how he wish. He has to have permission. Now, let's go to ver to chapter 2 of Job, and we'll see more. So he's going to attack Job, and he's going to um, he's going to attack Job's. Basically, when Satan attacked Job, he killed all his kids, and he killed his almost all his servants, and also he killed all the animals. And back in the times of Job, an animal was used as a trade, meaning it was like money. So when a person has thousands and thousands of animals, that means he was very wealthy. So what does Satan do? He brings raiders. They steal all his animals. That's like saying he had a financial collapse. All, all of his financial, um, you know, everything that he had financially was taken, meaning he was bankrupt. That's what that means. So that's what happened. So Satan took his kids and bankrupt him. Now let's go to Job chapter 2. We're going to read verse 3, and then we'll jump to 9 and, and, and 10. So verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Satan, "Have you?" So after Satan attacks Job the first time, Job does not give in. He stays faithful to God, even though he went through tragedy beyond anyone that could go to many. All his, all his kids were dead. I think he had 10 kids, and they all died. And also he was bankrupt. And also his servants died. So now Satan comes a second time. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there's none, for there's no one on earth like him, a man who is blameless and upright, who fears God and shuns evil. He still retains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Verse 9 and 10. Let me go up here. Now look what the devil does. He uses his own wife. It says, Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still re uh, retain your integrity? Curse God in that. You see that? That's the same words that Satan told uh, the Lord. I bet you, if you bring tragedy, or if you allow me to bring tragedy on Job, he will curse you to your face. And look what the wife says. Look, just die already and curse God and, you know, like curse God and die. That's what she says. So she's echoing Satan's words. Okay. Verse 10. Look what Job's reply was. You speak as a foolish woman speaks. He told her, should we accept from God only good and not adversity and all this? Job did not sin. And what he said. So basically, external factors is how Satan can manipulate your mind so that he could cause you to abandon the Lord. He cannot control your mind to abandon, or else he would have done it to every believer. He has to use outside forces. Basically, he has to make your life a living hell so you cannot take it and just abandon God. Meaning you throw in the towel and say, Lord, you're not helping me. You have abandoned me. You feel like God is no longer there or God does not love you anymore. And then you just throw in the towel. That's what he does. He pushes or he stretches your faith like a rubber band. If you get a rubber band and it's thick, right? The moment you start stretching the rubber band, what happens to the rubber band? It starts getting thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner until it what? pops well satan what he does through um external uh, factors he stretches your face so much that he wants it to pop but if you're a true believer god will not allow that to happen the lord will be your strength just like job here i would recommend for you guys to at least read job chapter one and two and if you can i would recommend highly recommend for you to read job the whole book of job i think it's 42 chapters but it's worth it 
And you're going to see why God allowed Job to go through what he went through and what will be, you know, what was the outcome of Job when he went through those things. So that, that will help or give you an insight of the battles Christians go through and how Satan attacks you and what God allows and doesn't allow and things like that. Okay, now, so that was, so to answer question number one, which is, can genuine believers be mind control? The answer is absolutely not. That is fiction. That is sci-fi. The Bible completely contradicts that type of notion. People cannot be mind control because God, since the beginning, like we read in Genesis, God gave man choice. He has never, he would never allow that choice to be taken or else how can God at the end judge you for your sins? If you rejected Jesus Christ, how can he judge you for that if you were mind controlled to reject Jesus or to do evil? Everyone will be judged according to their deeds. How can he do that if you if you have been mind controlled? So basically mind control is false. The scripture goes against mind control. Now the scripture does say mind manipulation or deception. That is what Satan does. Okay, so now let's go to question number two. Question number two was from Jan. Hello, and thank you for your question. And she asks, please help me to have a better of what it is to be carnally minded and spiritually minded. So she wants to know the difference. Okay, so for this, we go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 5 through 9. And it says, Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The mind of the flesh is death. What that means is when, when you have the mind, when your mind is inclined to please the flesh or to live carnally, that would bring you death, meaning separation from God. Okay, so let's continue. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, because the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Meaning when you're living a sinful lifestyle, according to the flesh, you would never do what God wants you to do. You will never surrender to God's will because you're in it for yourself to please the flesh, to sin, and to gratify your desires, your, your fleshly desires. Nor can it do so. Those controlled by the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you, however, are not controlled. Uh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. You, however, are controlled not by the flesh, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Okay, so to be carnally minded is to give in to your fleshly desires. Meaning, if let's say you have tendencies to steal, then carly, carly minded means that you are going to practice uh, that type of um, desire. You're going to actually give in to that desire and start stealing. If you're carnally minded, let's say you have a you know somebody does something wrong to you, and you want to you have some inner hatred towards that person that it wants to come out. Well, if you're carnally uh, carnally minded, you are going to give in to those desires and you're going to start um harboring hatred towards that person if you want to let's say um go and be with another person even though you're married right you will give in to that if you're carnally minded so men so basically carnally minded just means that you're giving in to the flesh you're giving in to sinful practices that's what that means that you give in to a lifestyle that does not please god so now let's go to Galatians chapter five because it has to do with the same thing, okay? It says in verse 17, starting in verse 17. So this is Galatians five, verse 17. For the flesh craves, okay, see there? For the flesh craves what is contrary to the spirit. So right off the bat, when the flesh craves something that's completely contrary to the spirit, that means the flesh craves sin because the spirit is God's spirit and the spirit of God craves what? righteousness it delights in righteousness and truthfulness in the light while the sin craves darkness it craves um sinful acts and things like that so um the flesh craves contrary that which is contrary to the spirit and then let's continue and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh they are opposed to each other so that you do not do what you want but if you are led by the spirit you are not under the law 
verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. So then when they're going to give you some synonyms or some sinful acts that the flesh does, meaning if you're carnally minded, this is the type of lifestyle you're going to live. Okay, so verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual morality. And sexual, that phrase sexual morality means everything under the sun that has to do with sexual acts. It could be homosexual. It could be, you know, committing adultery, fornication, anything like that. That's what it means. Impurity and debauchery, idolatry and sorcery, meaning any type of occultic practices, any type, all types of occultic practices. Hatred, discord, jealousy and rage, rivalries of divisions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you practice, if, the, if you're given over to our, you know, a carnally minded person and you're constantly doing it, that means that most likely you don't have the Holy Spirit. You are still dead in your sins. You have not, have, you have not had a conversion yet. Now, a Christian could fall for a short time. And then the Christian, if he's truly a believer, he will repent and get back on his feet and continue the walk of righteousness. He cannot stay there for a long period of time because then it shows that he was never converted. So a Christian do struggle because why? Because when we get saved, our spiritual man, our spirit inside is the one that gets regenerated, meaning it becomes holy and desires God. Our flesh does not get regenerated yet. That is at the rapture where we get our new body, which will be sinless. So that's where we have a constant uh, battle within ourselves because uh, our mind, part of our mind wants to sin and the other part wants to do righteousness, wants to please God. And that's why we're constantly fighting within each other. And, the sa and Satan doesn't help because what, what does Satan do? He is like a salesperson. He starts showing you sin to feed the flesh. See, Satan wants to feed the flesh, but God wants to feed your soul, your spirit. And how do you feed your, your spirit? Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So if you feed your soul, the word of God daily, then you will strengthen your soul, your spirit to be stronger than the flesh. So when, when you're being tempted to sin, you'll be stronger to control those desires and to put it to death or meaning to put it down and hold it and not give in to that. When your mind be starts to become carnally, meaning it wants to do things that does not please God, your spirit mind, let's say, um, controls that, that type of impulse. Why? Because it is stronger through the word of God. And then it puts it, to, you know, it, it, it stops it, meaning puts it in a chokehold. It will not allow it to spring forth. Basically, you will not give in to the temptation that you're being offered at that time. Now, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to show you that a true Christian, it's impossible for a true Christian to live a lifestyle of sin. For that, we go to 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 6 and 9. So verse 6, it says here, No one who remains in him, referring in Christ, keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. Well, it says here, remains, uh, keeps on sinning, meaning a lifestyle, a prolonged life of debauchery, of all that, that thing I read in, in Galatians chapter 5, meaning you're living your lifestyle. Um, when someone sees you, they see you as a person that lives that type of lifestyle. See, that means that if you're a Christian, you cannot be living like that. You know, you'll be struggling. Let's say you'll be battling certain things. But a, a non-believer, meaning a fake Christian who lives like that, does not battle. Why? Because he's already given over to that type of lifestyle. See, and this verse here, verse 6 says, um, no one who remains in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has seen him or known him. Meaning if you live a sinful lifestyle, that means that you have not been born again. Now look at verse 9. It shows you, verse 9 shows you how is it that you cannot live a sinful lifestyle. So look what it says. Verse 9 says, anyone born of God, meaning born again, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, refuses to practice sin, okay? Because God's seed abides in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. So the moment you receive the Holy Spirit, it keeps you from a lifestyle of sin. Impossible. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will convict you. And will really, uh, the sword, meaning God's word, will penetrate your heart and will show you that, you know, you are living wrong. You need to repent and get right. And then you're going to realize that. Why? Because you are an adopted son of God. You are a child of God. And you're going to see that and you're going to repent because God's spirit lives inside of you and your spirit 
has been born again, meaning it desires righteousness. So when it sees that, the Holy Spirit will give your spirit the power to repent and to stop doing that type of sin and ask God for help like that. Okay, now we're going to look at question number three. This is from Bonnie Barbie. Thank you for your question. Asks, will we have jobs to do in heaven? So she has two questions. So she has two questions. That's the first one. The second one is, can we watch over our family left on earth? So I'm going to answer the first question, which is, will we have jobs to do in heaven? Okay, so for this, we're going to go to Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, basically, God is speaking to Daniel, and he's giving revelations of the future. And Daniel doesn't understand, but he's telling Daniel, look, Daniel, this is not for you to understand. You're going to die. You're going to be gathered to your people. And at when you arise, meaning at your resurrection, and we're going to see what the verse says. So this is a reference to the millennial reign. We're going to talk about the millennium. When Jesus reigns with the saints for 1,000 years, Satan and his demons are cast to the bottomless pit, chained up for 1,000 years so that they could not be an influence on humanity. And we're going to see what the saints are going to do in the millennial reign. Okay, so verse Daniel 12, verse 13, and it says, But as for you, go on your way until the end. You will rest and will arise, meaning you will resurrect with a new body, a spiritual body, to your inheritance at the end of the day. So Daniel is going to be giving a position, inheritance here, meaning he's going to be given a position according to how he lived for God on earth. So each saint, whatever you did for the Lord on earth, that's going to be your reward in the millennial reign. You're going to be giving positions. And not only that, also at the end of the world, when he creates a new heaven and a new earth, which we're going to see. So let's go to Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, it's going to give you more insight of that. So we're going to go to Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to read, um, we're going to start in verses 21 and 22, and then we'll jump to verses 25 and 27. So let's go first read 21 and 22. So right here. So 21 and 22. It says, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints. Okay, this horn is in reference to the Antichrist. And if you want to see the link of this, you go to Revelation chapter 13. Okay, as I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days, a.k.a. Jesus Christ, arrived and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints. That means this is in reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ, not the rapture, but the second coming. Uh, in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for them to possess the kingdom. You see that? So saints are going to possess authority. They're going to be given position of authority, all the saints, some less and some uh, some lower position, some higher position, according to what they did for God here on earth. Okay, so now let's read. Let's go to verses 25 to 27. And this is what it says. He will speak out against the Most High and oppress the saints of the Most High, intending to change the appointed times and laws. And the saints will be given into his hand for look how long. For time, that's one year. And times, that's two years. And a half a time, that's six months. That That is three years and a half. So basically, for the last part of the Great Tribulation, the last half, which is three and a half years, um, the Antichrist will take off his mask claim to be God, the second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three, and, and also Revelation 13 and demand worship and the mark of the beast, meaning 666 for the last part of the great tribulation. Okay. Verse 26, but the court will convene and his dominion will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. That's in reference to Revelation chapter 19. When Jesus comes down on a white horse with the saints, he's going to open up his mouth. A sword comes out of his mouth, which is a symbol of a spoken word. The sword is always in the New Testament is in reference to the word of God. So Jesus speaks a word, all everybody that it's it uh, comes with Antichrist, meaning all of his army, they drop dead. And then he gets, he sends out an angel, grabs the Antichrist, a false prophet, and throws him alive to the lake of fire, which is the second death. Those are the first two to enter the lake of fire for all eternity. Okay, so verse 27. Then, so after that event, okay. Then the sovereignty, dominion, and, and greatness of the kingdoms are under all of heaven will be given to the people. Remember, kingdoms, meaning plural, under all of heaven, meaning all the kingdoms of the world, will be given to the people, the saints of the Most High, 
his kingdom, referring to Christ, will be an everlasting kingdom, and he and all rulers will serve and obey him. So all the kingdoms of the world will be given over to the saints, those who were persecuted and those who lived before the great tribulation will be given the kingdoms of the world, meaning that all believers will be ambassadors for Jesus Christ and will be sent all over the world to represent Jesus Christ, who's going to reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Jerusalem. And all the other saints are going to represent Jesus Christ, and we're going to have a brand new body. We're going to have a spiritual body. We're going to be 100% perfection. No more um, straying from the truth. We're going to have pure motives. We're going to have full wisdom, and we're going to be sinless. So the justice we bring in other nations will be according to the Word of God, and we will execute the Word of God 100% all the time. So then the saints will work, will have a job in the millennial reign. So how about when Jesus, after the thousand years, and he creates a new heaven and a new earth, how about then? Will we have jobs in the new heavens? Well, for that, we go to the book of Revelation. So we go to Revelation chapter 21, and Revelation 21 and 22 is in reference to the end, meaning with this world no longer in, you know, exists, and then Jesus creates a new world for not only for us, but for the Father, for the Son. They're going to live with us, and angels are going to live with us. Everyone, angels and people, will live all together. And the new Jerusalem that's made of a gold and precious jewelry will come down, and he's going to be our light. There's no more sun or moon. It's always going to be daytime because the glory of the Lord will shine like the sun and it's going to permeate all area of the new planet. Angels will be there. We will be there. And then let's see. We have jobs there. Okay, so, so Revelation 21, we're going to start in verse 22. But I saw no temple in the city. That's referring to the new city, Jerusalem. Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, referring to the Father and the Son, are its temple. Verse 23, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine in it, like, like I explained earlier. Because... The glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its lamp. By its light, the nations will walk. So the nations mean that every believer is going to still represent their nationality, or they're going to be different. Everybody's not going to be the same. You're going to look like you did here, but with a with a perfect body, with a spiritual body. You're going to look radiant. You're going to look glorious, but yet there's still going to be differences from everybody, okay? By its light, the nations will walk, and into it, the kings of the earth, this is referring to people or saints in the new earth, they're called kings, so there's going to be one, uh, there's going to be multiple or more than one kings, and that's in reference to position. So kings of the earth refers to positions that saints will have in the new earth, meaning we're going to have jobs but it's going to be authority. So some saints, whatever you did here on earth, will be given to you in the new earth. So this old earth, if you were faithful and you did everything that God demanded from you, you know, Jesus, then whatever inheritance, whatever reward he's going to give you will be in a sense of position. So some will be kings, some will be princes, some will be nobles, let's say, it will be lower position. Now, of course, you're not going to have jealousy, you're not going to have rivalry or nothing like that. You're going to be happy for everybody. Everybody will be happy for you, whatever position you get, because everything is righteous. Everything is good. There's no such thing as evil in the new earth and cannot be. No evil can ever enter to it, enter in it. Uh, it says the king of the earth will bring their glory. Its gates will never be shut at the end of the days because there will be no night there. So it's always going to be daytime. Now, so here it tells you the kings of the earth, which is a reference to that time. So basically, we will work in heaven. We will work in the millennial reign and we will work in the new earth. How? In position. We will have responsibilities that Jesus will give each and every one of us according to what we did for him here. And whatever that looks like, it doesn't go into details, but it does tell you that we will have positions and responsibilities to carry out God's will in the new earth. So we will have jobs. Now, the second question that the person gave was, can we watch over our family left on earth? So I'm just going to go to one passage to that it talks about a little bit about that. 
which is in Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 1 and 2. And this is a reference people watching the saints. And the Bible tells you who are watching the saints. Are the people in heaven, meaning other saints are watching saints on earth, or who are watching the saints? So let's read it carefully, okay? No, so we're going to read verse 1 and 2 of Hebrews 12. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a such a great cloud of witnesses, you see that people are watching, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So then are saints watching us from heaven, so we gotta make sure that we live godly life? Absolutely not. If you look at here carefully, we are examples. We are the light of the world, right? Jesus says in, in Matthew, I believe it's Matthew 5, we are the light of the world, meaning you have to shine your light so people could see the truth. So who is, who are the ones watching you? It's the world, those around you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your bosses. Those are your cloud of witnesses. Why? Because you have to show Christ in you so that they could see Jesus and maybe they, you know, Jesus will soften their hearts and they may come to you and say, why are you so different? Why don't you retaliate? Why you take insults? Why you act so good? Why don't you act like everybody else and things like that? And then that gives opportunity for you to share the gospel and what Jesus did in your life and why you look so different from everybody else because of the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you could witness to that person. So here it says, therefore, since we have, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, meaning since you're living as a Christian on earth, be aware that people are watching you, people are observing you. And so you must live a life that pleases God, that honors God. If you go to the gospel, Jesus condemned the Pharisees because they were pushing people away through their sinful lifestyle. And then Jesus says that they are sending people to hell because of their actions. So that's the same reference here that the great cloud of witnesses are people around you, like I mentioned. And then that's what it says. Let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles. Meaning if there's sin that you keep falling into, you have to overcome that quickly because people are watching you. And you're giving through your actions, you're giving a testimony. So you have to be very careful what you're doing because people are watching you and you might throw them off from Christ. If you're living in such a way as a hypocrite, guess what happens? If you're living like one of those, then you have just destroyed your testimony. Instead of bringing them to Jesus, you're pushing them away from Jesus. And that's really bad, okay? And then it says, let us throw, let us run with the endurance, the race set out for us. Meaning we have to run with endurance. Basically, you have to continue to trust in Jesus when things get really hard. When you want to throw in the towel, you cannot do that. You cannot throw in, matter of fact, a Christian doesn't have a towel. We're not supposed to have a towel to throw in and give up. There's no such, a, you know, there's no such thing as a Christian giving up or abandoning their faith. That's a big no-no. That cannot be. We don't have that type of option. There is no option to give up because if you abandon Christ, meaning if you show yourself to be a false believer, you will go to hell. That is the consequences. But a true believer will endure even to the end. We will endure. We will not give up because a true Christian does not have a towel to throw in. A true Christian will never abandon their faith. A true Christian, you know when you get a rubber band and you squeeze it and it gets really thin, to pop, it will never pop. Our faith is much more stronger than a rubber band. You could pull as much as you want. It will never give way. It will never tear. It will never break. Because our faith is not from us, but it's given to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. So to answer the question, the witnesses, meaning the do, do saints in heaven watch us? The answer is no. They do not watch us. Why? Because they're in heaven with the Lord. Now, do they remember us? Do they think about us? I would say probably yes. You see that in Luke chapter 16, when the rich man went to hell, Lazarus and the rich man, when the rich man died and went to hell, he was thinking about his brothers not to come to where he was at. And he wanted Abraham to somehow uh, speak to God on, on, on Lazarus' behalf to be resurrected, to go to his brothers. 
so he could preach to them so they won't end up in hell like like the rich man so the rich man is an eternity right because hell is an is being in an eternal state if he's in hell being tormented and he thinks about his brothers how much more will the saints in heaven think about their families wishing and hoping that they do get saved that they do come to the knowledge of jesus christ so that they could see them again in glory but can they actually physically look through some type of tunnel or some type of special view site in heaven and to see us the bible doesn't support that anywhere i have not seen such a verse so i cannot conclude that that happens because the bible it, it, it doesn't say it it just it does mention that you know most likely they do think of the loved ones like i said earlier and things like that but to see it, there's no verse um that will support that so i want to thank you for your questions and this will be next week i will do another q a so if you have other questions remember to put it in the comment section i will write it down and then next week i will answer them thank you for listening